Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture in finance. This lecture will be focused on the cost of capital, chapter 9. Our learning goals for this chapter are number one, understand the basic sources of capital and how they're associated with the cost of capital. Explain what is meant by marginal cost of capital, determine the cost of long-term debt, and explain why the after cost of debt is the relevant cost of debt we want to add into our cost of capital. We're going to look at determining the cost of preferred stock, calculating the cost of common equity, as well as converting the, into the cost of retained earnings and the cost of new stock. And we're going to look at how to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so first, let's define what the cost of capital is. First thing is, what is capital? Basically, in business sense, capital is money. Capital is the oil in the engine of the business that keeps it going. Now, the cost of capital represents the firm's cost of financing. So it's the, and it's also considered the minimal rate of return that a project must earn to increase the firm's value. So <clears throat> think of it this way. If you were going to finance your college education, some of it from government-backed student loans, private student loans, loans from family, credit cards maybe, each of these have a different rate of interest. So we're just, and each of them represent a different cost to capital because they have a different rate of interest. So then we're looking at the total amount of money you're borrowing and finding a weighted average cost of that capital. And that's the total, that's the, the that interest rate would be the cost of your education. <clears throat> so then you would say, is the cost of this education going to result in a degree that will return more to me than what I'm, than what I'm investing in this education? And for most people with a business degree, the answer is yes, even at very high rates of interest. Um, but for financial managers, they have to invest in projects that are expect to exceed the return of cost of capital. Otherwise, the company's not making any money. Uh, it's sort of like you wouldn't use a credit card to buy a bond. So you put $1,000 on your credit card at a 10% interest rate, um, investing in a bond that pays a 3% interest rate. It just doesn't make sense. You're paying, you know, you, you could be paying... $800 in interest and only earning $300 in interest, okay, which would be a $500 loss. So, mo um, so the cost of capital reflects the entirety of the firm's financing activities. And most firms attempt to maintain an optimal mix of debt and equity financing. And this is something you, <clears throat> if you look at the um, Zoom simulation, you want to keep an optimal mix between borrowing of long-term, short-term debt and equity. Because the mix, what makes it optimal, is it makes the lowest cost of borrowing. So if you borrow too much from one source, then the cost of that one source is going to be too great. So if you borrow too much long-term debt, you'll see the interest rate skyrocket. If you borrow too much equity, you'll see your, your um, earnings per share plummet. So you want a mixture that's going to optimize your borrowing in a way that will enhance your investments and your return on your investments. And that's basically what this chapter is about. So to capture all the relevant co financing costs, assume, you know, we want to assume some desired mix of financing, and we need to look at the overall cost of cap capital rather than just the cost of any single source of financing. Okay, so assume, uh, let's see, uh, assume a firm is currently faced with two investing opportunities. Uh, so assume investment A, it costs $100,000, for 20 year life and the expected return on this investment is 7%. And then the, the least costly financing available is debt, which would be 6%. Because a firm can earn 7% <clears throat> investment on the funds and only costing 6%, uh, the analyst uh, recommends that the firm undertake the investment because you're getting more in return than you are paying in, in financing. Let's look at investment B. The cost is 100,000, the life is 20 years, and the expected return is 12%. That's a very nice return. <clears throat> However, if the cost of financing was 14%, say it was the cost of equity, then in this instance, the analyst would, would not recommend to take on this investment. They would reject the opportunity because the cost of financing at 14% is greater than the return at 12%. So what if there was a mix instead? So instead of taking all debt or equity, we decided to have a mix, 50% debt, 50% equity. 
So here we would take 50% uh, times 3% debt and 50% times 14% equity, and we get a weighted average cost of capital of 10%. So this average financing makes the, um, would re actually reject the first opportunity and accept the second opportunity. So in this case, you get the opposite result when you weight average the cost. So, because the expected returns in the second example are 12%, and that's greater than 10%. In the first example, the returns were 7%, which is less than 10%. So if the company had a, uh, weighted its two options of, of raising funds, you would reject the first, accept the second. Okay, so let's think about some ethics and profits. So in this class, we talk a lot, a lot about maximizing shareholders' wealth, maximizing profits. The simulation for this class is all about maximizing profits. Um, where does ethics fit in? Well, let's look at Vioxx. Uh, and it was immediate success in 1999, quickly reached 2.5 billion in annual sales. However, a Merck study launched in 1999 fa eventually found that patients who took uh, Vioxx suffered from the risk of heart attacks and strokes, an increased risk. So despite the risks, Merck continued to market and sell the drug. Uh, Vioxx was withdrawn from the market in 2006, dealing a severe blow to the firm's reputations, profits, and stock prices. So the Vioxx recall increased Merck's cost of capital. What effect would, would an increased cost of capital have on the firm's future and investments? Okay, so basically they chose profits over common sense here, and they kept this market, this drug in the market far too longer than they should. Even though they were making short-term profits, they were maximizing short-term profits, but they were hurting their longer-term profits because at, when they when they withdrew the drug, <clears throat> the profits in the stock price were reduced, making the cost of capital more expensive. So companies who are ethical in the short-term and the long-term will have fewer financial problems than companies who are unethical based on that example. Okay, so let's look at an overview of cost of capital, sources of long-term capital. So we have a current liabilities, but we don't wanna look at that. We wanna look at the sources of long-term capital. So we can do long-term debt, shareholders equity, preferred stock, common equity, common stock. So these are all areas of um, stock. So basically it means preferred stock is a type of stock where you, get a, you pay a guaranteed dividend. Uh, and these are all on the shareholders' equity. So common stock equity and uh, common stock are basically the same thing. This is just regular stock. And then we have retained earnings. And this is the money that the company makes but doesn't uh, spend on assets. So all these are long-term sources of capital for a company. And they each have their own cost of capital and their own way of calculating their cost of capital. So first, let's look at the cost, long-term cost of debt. So... Now, the pre-tax cost of debt is the financing cost associated with new funds through the long-term borrowing. So this is basically when a company issues a bond and the funds are raised through selling corporate bonds through the financial markets. So the net proceeds received from the firm of the sale of the security. Now, when you sell a bond, you go through an investment banker and they're gonna take what's called a flotation cost. And that cost is the cost of issuing the security and bringing it to the markets and doing all the paperwork and all the legal aspects of it. And the two main components of these flotation costs are underwriting costs, which is you know um, compensation for the investment bankers for selling the security, and administrative costs, the paper expenses for the legal accounting and printing of um, this issuance. Now, for example, um, <clears throat> Dutchess Corporation has is a major hardware manufacturer and is it's thinking about selling $10 million worth of 20-year bonds with a 9% coupon. The 9% coupon just means the percent. They say coupon because you used to get bonds with this book of coupons, and you would take the coupon to the bank and get your money. But now they don't know more books of coupons anymore, but they just say coupon rate still. <clears throat> and a par value of $1,000. So the par value for a bond means that's what they're going to sell it at, $1,000. So the current market interest rates are greater because the current market interest rates are greater than 9%, the firm must sell the bond at a discount. So they're going to sell it at 980 and the flotation costs are 2% or $20. So then the net proceeds are going to only be $960 because of the selling it at a redu reduced price and the flotation costs. Now, the before cost of debt, which is R to the D, is simply the rate of return 
firm must pay for new borrowing. However, the, bef the before cost of debt can be calculated <clears throat> in three ways. Uh, using the market quotation, uh, which is basically the year to maturity, or YTM, yield to maturity, calculating the cost, you know, find the before tax cost of debt by calculating the yield to maturity generates the bonds, cash flows, and approximating the cost. Um, so then the cash flows associated with the bond is in, you know, in year zero, we're getting, we're getting this cash flow that we calculated the net proceeds. And then from year one to 20, we are paying interest in year 20, we're paying the bond back. Then this thousand dollars goes back to the original investors. So we can determine that the cost of debt by finding the yield to maturity, which is a discount rate that equates to the present value of the bond outflows in the initial of the initial outflow. So, okay, okay. So if we look at the next slide here, uh, we're going to calculate. We can use Excel to calculate the before tax cost of debt. So let me bring up Excel here. And you see that, let me just make this smaller, so you can see. Okay, so I just kind of copied what they had here into Excel, and we want to use the rate formula. So we're going to use rate. And end periods are, let's see, we would say um, these are the periods, and we're going to multiply that by number times per year it's calculated most bonds are calculated twice a year but here they're showing one payment would be 90 present value this is the present value future value is a thousand dollars that we're going to pay back in the future type it's ordinary it's ordinary so we're going to put zero let's hit okay okay so we calculate the before cost of debt of 9.85 i'm sorry 9.45 all right so that's, that's one way you could calculate the before cost of debt. And this is factoring in our, our yearly interest payments, which is our outgoing cash flow, our par value, which is this is the payment we'll make on the future, in the future when the bond comes due, our coupon rate of 9%, 20 periods at compounding once a period, and our net, net proceeds that we calculated before were 960 because it's after flotation and after any discount for interest rate changes. So the actual cost of debt before tax is 945. Now, uh, this is another way of calculating that. So it's, it's, not, it's not as accurate as a spreadsheet, but it's a, a way of calculating the approximating the cost and you see it comes close to the spreadsheet. So if you had to do it by hand, that's why I would, that's why I wanted you, I prefer you do it by spreadsheet, especially in any homework problems, because this formula will get you the rate, but it's a little bit more lengthy and is not always as accurate. Okay, so let's move to the after-tax cost of debt. So for businesses, the cost of debt is tax deductible, which is a great thing. So the actual real cost of debt is the after-tax cost of debt, as far as our cost of capital is concerned. So the interest payments paid to the bondholders are tax deductible from the firm. So the interest expense on the, on the debt reduces the firm's taxability um, income and therefore reduces the tax liability. So to calculate this, we would take the uh, the cost of the debt and multiply it by one minus the tax rate. So we could kind of say that Dutchess Corporation has a 40% tax rate using the 9.45% we calculated in Excel. Uh, we will find the after-tax cost of debt to be 567. So that would be the, the current before tax cost of debt and we're going to multiply that by one minus the tax rate and we come up with the actual rate the company will be paying after the tax deduction of 5.67 percent and that's one benefit of issuing debt is tax deductible so let's look at a personal finance example um the sullivans are a married couple in the 28 percent federal income tax bracket they wish to borrow sixty thousand dollars for a new car they can borrow the sixty thousand through an auto dealer an annual interest rate of 6%, or they can take a $60,000 second mortgage on their home at an annual rate of 7.2%. So you might say, well, the 6% is better because it's lower. However, tax uh, interest, interest paid on car loans are not tax deductible, whereas interest paid on mortgages, second mortgages, are tax deductible. So if they borrow from the auto dealer, the interest and the consumer loan will be not be deductible for federal tax purposes. 
However, the interest in the second mortgage will be. That's basically what I said before. So because the interest in the auto loan is not, deduct not tax deductible, you're paying the, gonna pay the full 6%. However, because the interest on the auto loan is on the auto loan, because the interest on the, this should say, not auto loan, but second mortgage loan. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. Because the interest in the second mortgage loan is tax deductible, the after-tax cost equates to uh, the 7.2% times one minus their tax rate of 28%, so it's actually 5.2%. So in this case, it'd be better off to take a second car, second mortgage on their house to pay for this car. Uh, the best thing they should do though, is just not buy this um, $60,000 car at all, because it seems like it's too much for the Sullivans to afford. Okay, cost of preferred stock. So what is preferred stock? It's preferred, so it means it's better. And what that basically means is that preferred stock pays a guaranteed dividend. So it's sort of a perpetuity. And you know, if you remember the perpetuity formulas from the time value money chapter, this is basically that same formula, but we're expressing it to a preferred stock. And back in chapter five, I had said that a good example of a perpetuity is preferred stock. So preferred stock gives um, preferred shareholders the right to receive a dividend a stated dividend before they can distribute it, distribute any money to the common shareholders. So they are the preferred shareholders. Um, and usually this preferred dividend stated as an annual rate. So to get the cost of preferred dividend, we just take the dividend and we divide by the net proceeds from the sale of preferred stock. And that is going to be the net proceeds per share. So as an example, the, um, they're going to issue of a 10% preferred stock and they're expecting it to sell for $87 per share. So the cost of issuing and selling the stock is $5 per share, which is the flotation cost. So the dividend is $8.70, and which is $10 times the 87. The net proceeds are going to be $82 minus the flotation costs. So we would just take the 870 divided by the 82 and we get a cost of preferred stock of 10.6%. Now let's talk about the cost of common stock. So the cost of common stock um, is, the, is the required return based on the risks for investors who invest in the stock through information in the marketplace. So the two forms of common stock financing are retained earnings and new issues of common stock. So the cost of common stock, we're gonna denote as R to the S. And this is the rate at which investors discount the expected dividends of, um, of the firm to determine its share price. Okay, so here is the constant growth model, dividend valuation model, and assumes that the value of share of stock equal, equals the present value of all future dividends. So you, know, you might notice this formula looks very familiar to a, similar to a future value formula or a present value formula. No, this is the present value formula. Um, so we're going to assume a constant rate of growth and the dividends, which is important for this model. So it would be a company promising a constant rate of growth of the dividends for the near forever, infinite time horizon. So P0 would be the, we're trying to find P0, which is the stock price. D1 is the dividends expected at the end of year one. Uh, RS is the required rate of return for common stock. And G is the constant growth rate. So if I have D, R, S, and G, I can figure out what the stock price should be. Now, Many times we, want, we don't want to solve for P, we might know the stock price, but we don't know the rate of return. And that's what we need to know for cost of capital is R to the S. So we could rearrange this formula through the magic of algebra and we get R to the S equals dividend divided by price plus growth rate. Okay. All right, so uh, Dutchess Corporations wishes to determine the, uh, its cost of common stock, um, common stock equity, the market price, P of the common stock is $50 per share. The firm's expected to pay a dividend next year of uh, $4 at the end of the coming year, 2016. The dividend paid on the outstanding shares over the past six years are as follows. So these are dividends are paid. So this is important because this is how we can calculate the growth rate. So uh, we can calculate the annual growth rate and dividends have grown from 2007 to 2012. And it turns out that's an approximate rate of 5% or more precisely 5.5%. 
So, up, so substituting D1, $4 for D1, $50 for P0, and $5 for G, we could calculate the, um, the, we could calculate the, the required rate of return for the stock. So 4 divided by 50 plus 5% equals 8% plus 5% or 13%, which would be the cost of stock. Okay, so one way to calculate, so if you look here, to calculate that growth rate is you could do a function in Excel, um, and it could be the uh, function would be log est, and then you do your y variables. This box is too big. All right, so your y variables, and then you can do your x variables, which are the periods, and then hit OK. And uh, basically, this is sort of our 95. And one minus that would be the 5% that they're showing on this slide, that growth rate of 5%. OK, um, capital asset pricing model. We've talked about this before in the previous uh, chapter. And this is a model we can use to calculate the um, return on stock. So risk-free rate plus beta times market return minus risk-free rate will give us our uh, risk-free rate of return, oh, sorry, our, our required rate of return for our capital, our stock, R to the S. So this is a formula we're familiar with from the previous chapter, and here we could use it to calculate the, the required return, rate of return for stock. And this is good if the, this is a great formula to use if the company has no dividends, and you can use the capital asset pricing model to calculate the cost of stock. Uh, now, so say Dutch's company wishes to calculate its cost of common equity uh, using the capital asset pricing model. So then you would need to know the risk free rate, which is 7%, the beta, which is 1.5, and the market return, which is 11. So plugging these variables into the formula, we get a, a cost of capital of 13%. Okay. Now, the capital asset, capital asset pricing model, it differs from the constant growth model in that it directly considers the firm's risk using beta in determining the required rate of return. Whereas the constant growth model doesn't look at risk at all, it's reflecting the um, preferences of, the, um, of dividends and the dividend growth. And the constant growth valuation model and the capital asset pricing model techniques for funding are so theoretically equivalent. Uh, therefore, the practice estimates from the two methods don't always agree because they're theoretically equivalent, but they may be they might come in different numbers. Okay. Another difference is is that when the constant growth model is used to find the cost of common stock equity, it can easily be adjusted for in flotation costs um, to find the co the new common stock. Capital asset pricing model does not provide adjustment mechanism for flotation. So the difficulty in adjusting the cost of the common stock equity calculated by using the capital asset pricing model occurs because its common for form of the model does not include um, the market price variable to take into account adjustment of flotation costs. Okay, so let's look at, so the, re the cost of retained earnings is the same as the cost of, of equivalent fully subscribed equity. So we're going to say cost of retained earnings, R to the R, is the same as the cost of stock, which is R to the S. Okay. So retained earnings is the preferred source of financing because the company has it. It doesn't have to apply for it. So in the United States, firms rely very heavily on retained earnings to finance the purchase of their assets. So... Um, for example, in 2013, a survey of Chinese firms found that 64% of companies surveyed listed retained earnings as their primary source of funds, and bank loans were a distant uh, second choice mentioned as a primary source of funds by just 44 companies. Okay, so the cost of issuing common stock, cost of new issues of common stock. So what if you're going to issue new stock? So new stock has a, um, the additional cost of flotation costs. So New shares are underpriced if the market if the stock is sold at a price below the current stock price. So that could be another making the new issuing new stock even more costly than the current stock. So how we would calculate this 
we can use a constant growth model, um, and, um, but we're going to set n to the n, which represents the net proceeds from the new sale of common stock. So we could use that same constant growth model, but our n to the n is going to be the proceeds from the new stock. So we'll say that the net proceeds from the sale of the common stock would be n to the n, which should be less than the current price of the stock because of the cost associated. Therefore, the cost of the new shares will always be greater than the existing cost of the current stock, um, which is equal to the retained earnings. So it's the most expensive form of it raising new equity is, of, and is to issue new shares of stock. All right, so if we, here's an example where Dutchess Corporation is selling $50, $50 per share to determine a new common stock. Um, he estimated that the new share price will be sold at $47, the $3 per share underpricing is due to the competitive nature of the market. And the second cost has an additional flotation cost of $2.50. So the total underpricing the flotation costs shares would be $5.50. So we would use a dividend of $4 and we divide it by the $44.50, which is the $50 per share minus the $5.50, um, which is the underpricing of the shares uh, plus the growth rate. So that would equal 9% plus 5% or 14% in total for the cost of new equity, which is 1% higher than the 13% of retained earnings or existing equity. Okay, now let's look at how we would weight the average cost of capital. And we did, we've done something similar to this in um, previous exercises. Uh, and we're taking the, when we did the um, average portfolio beta was a similar concept or the average portfolio return was a similar concept. So here to get the R to the A, which is the weighted average cost of capital, we would take the weight from the first, um, the, the weight, the percentage of the first source of funds times the rate of the first source of funds, multi plus added to the weight of the second source of funds, which would be preferred stock, um, minus the second rate of that second set of funds. And we just keep doing this, moving it on. So WI is proportion of long-term debt and capital structure. WP is proportion of preferred stock and WS is the proportion of common stock. And all three of these have to add up to uh, 100%. So three important points to note is the computational convenience. It's important to con convert the, the weights into decimals form and leave the uh, individual costs in decimal and percentage terms. Uh, the weights must be non-negative and they have to add up to 1%. So the weights really are percentages of a pie, a whole pie, 100%. And the firm's common stock weight, common stock equity weight is multiplied by either the cost of retained earnings or the cost of new common stock. Uh, which cost is used depending on the firm, whether the firm is going to, um, you know, um, the firm's going to use uh, common ec stock equity or or we'll be financing using retained earnings or we'll be financing using new common stock. Okay, so we earlier we talked about this Dutchess company. We calculated the cost of debt, the after-tax cost of debt, the cost of preferred stock, the cost of retained earnings, and the cost of new stock. Uh, it was, leaves us with the following weight. So their total capital structure is going to be 40% long-term debt, 10% preferred stock, and 50% common stock equity. So if we put that into a chart, here are our weights, it's 100%. So we're breaking up our source of capital by 40% debt, 10% preferred stock, 50% equity. And here are the costs that we calculated for each of these sources. And we're just going to multiply 40% times 5.4%, uh, 10% uh, times 10.6%, 50% times 13%. And these are the results. Add these three result, results together, find some of that, and that's our weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so in this example, U.S. financial markets experience, uh, experience and recovered from the 2008 financial crisis and 2009 Great Recession. Uh, firms struggled to keep track of their weighted average cost of capital since the individual components were moving ra rapidly in response to the financial market turmoil. So the financial crisis pushed credit costs to the point where long-term debt was largely inaccessible and great in the Great Recession saw Treasury bond yields for, fall to historic lows, making the cost of equity uh, projections appear unreasonably low. So uh, the CEO of this company, he reported that his company dealt 
with the cost of capital uncertainty by abandoning the one size fits all approach. So why do firms generally use both a short and long run way to average cost of capital? Because things are uncertain and you want to be able to calculate it as accurately as possible with the information you have for in the short and long term. Okay, so let's look at some other market measures. Uh, we have book value versus market value. So book value uh, are weights use the accounting values to measure the portion of each type of capital in the firm's financial structure. And market value weights are weights that use the market values to measure the portion of each type of capital in the firm structure. So historical versus target, we can look at historical weights, either book value or market value weights based on actual capital structure proportions, or we could look at targeted weights, either book or market values based on desired capital structure proportions that we want. The, uh, from a strictly theoretical point of view, the uh, preferred weighting scheme is the target market value proportions. Okay, so let's look at a personal finance example. So Chuck is currently has a three outstanding loans, all of which mature in six years and can be repaid without penalty at any time prior to maturity. The outstanding balances on, on the annual and the annual rates of these loans are noted before. So he owes first loan is 26,000 at 9%, percent point six. Second loan is 9,000 at 10.6 percent, and the third loan is 45,000 at 7.4 percent. So uh, he found a lender who would loan him the 80,000, and notice that um, it's 45, 54, 80,000 is the amount of the outstanding balance for six years at a rate of 9.2 percent, on the condition that the loan proceeds be used to fully repay the three outstanding loans which were on the previous page, 26, 9, and 45, right here. Uh, Chuck wishes to choose the, bet, the least costly alternative, so either do nothing or borrow the 80,000. To figure out what he should do, we have to calculate his weighted average cost of capital. So for each uh, amount of the loan, we take the amount of loan divided by the total to get our weight and multiply it by the rate. So here we're using each loan divided by all the total pile of loans to get a percentage weight. Um, and multiplying by the rate following that same formula. So uh, the $26,000 26, loan is 32.5% of 80,000 times 9.6%. We're going to add that to the 9,000, which is 11% of 80,000 times 10.6%. And then the 45,000 is roughly 56% of 80,000. And we're going to multiply it by 7.5. Add the three results together, and we get a... Um, a total uh, weighted average cost of capital of 8.47. So given that the weighted average cost of capital of 80,000 current loan is loan at that is 8.5, it's well below that 9.2. So in that case, Chuck should um, do nothing and continue to pay back the loans because the average weighted cost of these loans are less than that 9.2%. Now, if I were Chuck, what I would do is I would go back and I would say, um, Maybe I would take a loan uh, of only 9000 to pay off this most expensive loan uh, and replace that $9,000 loan with this 9.2%. If you could do that, that would be the best. Okay, so that's the way to average cost of capital chapter. This is a one-week learning unit, so we are going to um, uh, just review the learning goals here. So under we understand the basic sources of capital associated with the cost of capital. And we, uh, we explain what is meant by the marginal cost of capital. And the marginal cost of capital is the next new dollar of funds being raised for the firm. And we are going to determine, we determine the long time cost of debt, explain why the after tax cost of debt is relevant. We looked at the cost of preferred stock. We looked at calculating the cost of equity, retained earnings, and new stock. And we learned how to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so that's it for Chapter 9, uh, Cost of Capital. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you.